vier Kolonnen und ich muss wieder Ich muss das auch technisch checken, ob das geht. Okay. Hannes? Hey Fabio. Danke. Ja, sehr cool. Hannes? Ja. Ah. Ja. Ich höre dich. Okay, ich dich auch. Äh. Wer, wer, wer wollte noch einen Check machen? Die Übersetzerin, richtig? Ja. Weißt du, wo sie, wie sie heißt, oder? Nein. Aber ich, ich, also wenn du sie vorhin gehört hast. Ich habe sie gehört. Ja. Dann Darum war mir nicht klar, warum sie noch, was sie noch, was noch zu checken war. Ja, yeah, vielleicht so ein bisschen.
こんばんは、えー、UOC の手のりです、えー、今日の司会を一緒にさせていただきます、えー、スイスバイタリートーク、えー、UOC トークイベント第一弾コラボレーティブコンストラクションズをご覧いただき誠にありがとうございます、えー、と UOC は、えー、ここですね2020年に、えー、ここ赤坂ビズタワー23階に開設した、えー、開校した創造性で未来を描くことを目指した研究機関です、えー、今回あのスイスバイタリートークとともに、えー、これからのコラボレーティブコンストラクションズについてディスカッションする場を開催することになりました、えー、僕自身、えー、サーキュラークリエイティビラボという研究をしているんですけども、えー、今日のセッションを楽しみにしています、えー、この配信は、えー、日本語と英語の2つのチャンネルがあります、えー、ご希望の言語のチャンネルでご覧ください、えー、リンクは YouTube のチャット、えー、または概要欄でご確認,ご確認いただけます、えー、それでは早速バイタリスイスバイタリティトーク UOC バース UOC トークを開催いたします。最初に在日スイス大使館広報文化部長のジョナス・スルーバさんよりスイスバイタリートークについてお話しいただきます。ジョナスさんよろしくお願いします。よろしくお願いします。ありがとうございます。Hey, hello everybody. Good evening. I'm I'm Jonas.、Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this uh, uh, Swiss Vitality Talk, the kickoff of our series here at at really beautiful, wonderful. Uh, University of Creativity, focusing tonight on the future of architecture. First of all, please let me thank our partner, University of Creativity, for welcoming us in this, in this wonderful setting. So, what is Swiss Vitality Talk? Well, this year, our embassy, together with many partners, is launching a new communication program called Vitality.Swiss. On the road to the Expo 2025 Osaka Kansai, we want to focus on three themes sustainability, health, and human centered innovation. And all that,、uh, thinking that the theme of、uh, Expo 2025, as you may know, is life. And so we also want to align with that and, and focus on life and, and healthy life with Vitality.Swiss. And we want to explore how. Japan and Switzerland can join forces in, in the fields of、uh, health, sustainability, and innovation with plenty of events and initiatives in fields such as medtech, food tech, age tech, sustainable finance, well being at work, work life balance, design, creativity, and, and there's much more. So if you want to follow us, please go to www.vitality.swiss. And so, the goal of the talk series is to really breathe life into these topics. And we start today with the very first event of、uh, Vitality.Swiss. As he just said, it's collaborative constructions,、uh, wonderful double installation at、uh, IT Triennale in Tokoname with、uh, two structures by ETH Zurich and the University of Tokyo. You will hear more about that、uh, tonight. So, the project was actually more than five years in the making. I, I think it is really a remarkable statement as to、uh, how technology can serve the purpose of circularity and sustainability. And before we move forward, I just want to thank our sponsors、um, BMW, IWC, Schaffhausen, Shimizu Corporation, Panasonic, and many more. All right? So, Let's get right into it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I, I look forward to sharing the evening with you tonight. Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you. えっと、ジョナサンから説明ありましたように、えー、現在あの建築の未来を、えー、探るスイスと日本の共同プロジェクトとして、えー、築き合うコラボレーティブ・コラコンストラクションズが、えー、国際芸術祭愛知2022の、えー、連携企画事業として常滑市で開催されています、えー、これはあのスイス連邦工科大学チューリッヒのグラマティオ・コーラー研究室と東京大学の小渕研究室の2つのイン,スインスタレーションから構成されています、えー、本日のトークはこの2つの建築ラボの実証例から発展させていきたいと思いますえー、そこで前半はキーノートとしてまずえこの2つの建築アプローチについてご説明いただきます。キーノートは、スイス連邦工科大学のえチューリヒのプロジェクトについて、グラマティオ・コーラー研究室のシニアリサーチャー、スピーカーはスミスター・ハネス・マイヤー、シニアリサーチャー、グラマティオ・コーラー・リサーチャー、ETH ・ズーリク。ハロー、ハネス。ハロー、プレッシャーと見えへん。プレッシャーと見えへん。
measurable change. So since 2005, Kramatsikola Research, the chair of architecture and digital fabrication at ETH Zurich, investigated how we can use the digital, digital data to inform the physical reality because architecture remains a physical discipline. We do need a roof above our head. The tool of choice for getting the data out of the digital virtual realm into the real world, in our world, has been the industrial robot that we know from manufacturing. Computational design, digital design, and robotic fabrication helps us to work with natural materials and reform the way we think about natural building materials, about sustainability, and how we can address some of the global challenges we are confronted with, climate change, emissions, and the consumption of material. The first project I show you to introduce you to our work that leads and led to collaborative constructions in Japan is the rock print pavilion, where we temporarily bound gravel and string into a pavilion structure. The robot in this case lays patterns of string, standard string, no magic. It places portions of gravel and compacts the two loose materials into a system where we can build columns, structures, turn loose material into architecture. But this material is only temporarily bound. We don't consume it. And once we don't use it anymore, we can simply unwind it. We can remove the roof and then pull the string and it will dissolve into its original material, travel and string. So that shows us how we can think about reusable material, about architecture that is only temporary and only temporarily binds material. Another project is the clay rotunda, where we turned clay, earthen material, through computational design and robotic fabrication, into architecture, into architecture that is very performative, but also celebrates its very specific aesthetic. The clay rotunda is a permanent building we've erected, built in Bern. It's five meter tall, tall and very thin, based on a robotic process where we place soft bricks that only consist of clay sand, water, and crit, and compact them, compress them into a soft bond. So again, digital data helps us to work with natural material, avoiding, for example, the firing, the carbon intensive firing of bricks. A third project leading up to collaborative constructions would be gradual assemblies for the Istituto Svizzero in Rome. Here, we work with our students of the Master of Digital Fabrication on a timber building method that only consists of timber. So we exploit the hygroscopic behavior of wood, which shrinks when it dries and swells when it's moist and the geometry of these dowels to hold the timber slabs in place. So no metal, no metal fasteners, no nails, no screws have been used to assemble the structure. And here you see a first glimpse into the robotic fabrication laboratory at ETH Zurich. The collaboration between students and the machines assembling the structures, the elements, from beech wood and spruce, assembling the elements that were then shipped and assembled in Japan. We explored this technique further 
für die Installation Upsticks at the Victorian Albert Museum in Dundee. Here we really exploited the geometric freedom of the system, exploring what spaces would be possible using such system. And again, no glue, no nails, no metal fasteners, just natural material timber. These were the projects that inspired us to bring some of our thoughts and technologies to Japan and to realize collaborative constructions in collaboration with the Embassy of Switzerland in Japan and the TADS lab at the University of Tokyo, where Professor Yusuke Obuchi will present after me. In Tokoname, you're at the heart of historic ceramics workshops, now little refined pottery ateliers. You come up the windy road and you're greeted by the gate that Obuchi Sensei's group realized that interprets a Noren gate through digital fabrication. Once you enter through the gate, you see our project a timber project, a timber frame project at the heart of this brownfield site surrounded by historic ceramics factories. You still see the chimney on the left. Our project translates the investigations in Rome and Scotland into a real building structure, one that you could possibly inhabit. And again, it's a structure that only consists of timber, where we interpreted traditional wood joints, the long history of timber frame construction in Europe, as you see it on the left, and in Japan, where you can think of the tradition of Miyadaiku, the carpentry that builds temples and shrines. All this knowledge has been accumulated over centuries, but then has partly been forgotten through the industrialization and the modern doctrine. So we combine tradition and innovation. We overcome this dichotomy and we rethink traditional methods of carpentry and timber construction for the age of robotics. So we are back in the robotic fabrication lab where we assembled the five modules that constitute the building in Japan. Every single one is individual and based on a unique geometry. More than a thousand parts have been CNC milled and produced and then connected, assembled by robots, connected by oak nails. Here you see some of the joints that we've developed, dovetail joints, the oak wood dowels, the diagonals that follow an irregular pattern, but also the structural requirements. Diagonals are more a European tradition in comparison to the more vertical uh, approach you find in Japan. We've developed the joints together with carpenters and timber engineering companies in Europe, but also with Shimizu in Japan. And we brought all this together in a computational model, in a computational model that helps us to move from the volume of the design all the way to the fabrication data integrating structural design and all the knowledge that is required to turn an idea into a building. And this allows us then to also work with robots on the assembly. We also developed a system that would allow us to play with the design. So to bring a human intention into play, we can move around these diagonals and the system would feedback on minimum distances required due to the structural design and the timber performance to 
have an optimal structure. Once we have all that and we finalize the design, the robotic fabrication allowed us to build these five modules, each unique in an efficient way. In the lab, you see how the robot is placing a diagonal in its position. But now you might also know that these robots are just machines. They are not per se intelligent. So we need to simulate and calculate their movements prior to assembling it. So again, the digital model allows us to control the process to avoid any collisions and to build efficiently. Having two robots, we can also work in parallel with the two robots of the gantry system, assembling the modules controlled by a single person. And you see the level of detail and the precision that we developed over the months during the project. Once the modules were completed, we shipped them in containers to Japan and we designed them for a very fast assembly. So the five modules were then assembled by Shimizu into this three-story structure connected by diagonals. And here you see these cantilevering modules stacked on top of each other. And you could imagine how you inhabit these spaces as a new domestic environment. The modules were connected by the diagonals that bring the forces from the top to the bottom. So everything, of course, has to withstand typhoons and earthquakes, has to be very strong, meet all the requirements. For that, again, we developed these timber joints that combine a European tradition of round dowels or wooden nails and square wedges that relate more to the Japanese tradition. And then the final structure, you see how it's very dense at the bottom, almost like a forest. You enter because the forces are higher and then it becomes light like a lantern that is overlooking the surrounding Tokunama village. It's very sturdy and you see how the differentiated joints constitute a very specific aesthetic also, a novel aesthetic of timber construction. And once you go in and look up, it turns into a universe of timber, the rectangular volumetry, the volume from the outside turns into a rich environment where you experience what timber construction can do, can do for us, for the community, and for the planet. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Hannes. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Yusuke Obuchi of Obuchi Laboratory of Tokyo University. Hi. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, University of Creativity for inviting us for today and also the uh, Embassy of Switzerland. Uh, okay. Let me uh, start my slides. Uh, I titled this talk uh, Towards the Vernacular Architecture of the Future. Uh, the title suggests, of course, this is a collaborative construction, but particularly for the kind of research that we do, I thought it would be known to talk about how the something that Hannes talked about that too, uh, something that tradition can continue but transform within the realm of digital uh, fabrication. It currently, uh, there are two types of uh, interests that I hear quite often. One is about something that Hannes talked quite a bit about how to embrace the robotic fabrications. So on the right, you're looking at <coughs> this uh, factory of the car that completely automated without human involvement. And the slides on the right, uh, there are lots of people uh, who are involved in collaboration 
a kind of communal effort to produce uh, the project. So those two are not necessarily opposite, but somewhat parallel, consistently kind of developing into new type of uh, fabrication processes. The other one that I would like to talk about, uh, there are four things I'd like to talk about, but this, the other one would be the human scale in spatial order. I think the uh, image on the right, uh, this is the uh, Le Corbusier developed this human scale that can be standardized to produce a mass produced items, furnitures and buildings and so forth. But at the same time, we recognize that all humans are different. Scales are different, they have a different ability, so we are interested in how to embrace the differences of the individual. And the other one is uh, big data and small data that I found it very interesting. Uh, right now, almost as if that we have lots of data that allow us to do lots of things. And also, uh, we think the data is free. But at the same time, we know that data isn't free. Data costs a lot of effort, and money, and the resources. So we tend to think that what are the possibility of small data versus digital um, or the big data? I think it's not, oh, here we go. And this I would like to talk more about. We're not gonna talk about too much this time. Hapticalized environment, like how visualization plus other sensorial system could also be embraced within understanding of a built environment. So those are kind of things that we embedded within our project. But today, I'd like to talk more about the project, particularly to do with this, uh, uh, what did I say? The mass produce, uh, the production processes, and also how the human can be part of the processes. Our project is very simple. The gate and the series of chain that makes uh, like a noran, the kind of gate fabric-like. And this noran, the, uh, the entrance curtain, chain-like, uh, these are made out of clay, that particularly the uh, embodiment of the tokoname. It's not advancing, here we go. Uh, Hannes talked about that already. Uh, so our project is surrounded by the pottery factory. So this is the ETH and Utokyo project, and the street used to be very narrow and quite compacted, but now all the uh, businesses and factories are kind of missing from their activity. So this became vacant, so we tried to fill the vacant lot with our project. Tokoname has lots of those strange pottery uh, that we use for the infrastructure, infrastructure, sometimes the foundation, sometimes using retaining wall. So we try to use those local elements into our project. We worked together with the Tokoname craftsmen to produce our elements. Uh, we're very delightful with that. So let me just talk about, so where is our project, the core of it? That is this chain link that made out of clay. And the clay, why clay? Because the Tokoname as the uh, pottery town, but at the same time, this natural material allows to produce an environment control system. So every morning, this gate is wetted by the water, by evaporation that takes the heat and cools this entrance about four degrees. But sometimes it's not enough. So we develop the mist system that allows to enhance the cooling. And the project is really about how to embrace the human potential and human ability. So we ask 14 people to participate in our project from age 13 to age 53. Ambition of project is anybody can participate in the production of architecture. They have a different skill, different ability, different strength, how we can embrace the human possibility into production. But at the same time, those people do not have a skill. So this is where the digital fabrication technology comes in to how to help these people to produce a complex project. So 
quickly to explain how it works is person will hold this clay chain like that will act as both in cooling as well as in the gate and shape like this. This is the most, uh, how do you say, stable uh, form. It's called catenary. So only thing that you need to do is to find the two position and the length of the, uh, this rope will create the geometry by itself. Once it's done, the computer will figure out where to position. I'll tell you more in the detail. Where would be the best place to position this? And the person will decide, because very first, the computer will tell you multiple options. The person will choose, the person is uh, my student, will choose where to position. And once the position is decided, the computer will send the data to the robot. Robot will make a hole, and hole will allow for the person to, say, hang that catenary. So how does that work? Come on. So the person holds this two ends, and we ask them, hold a certain kind of position, but in the most comfortable way. So we ask sometimes to hold it like that, but the person cannot hold. They goes like that, or sometimes goes like this, or sometimes goes that. So we ask them to use your capacity to generate this geometry. So everybody becomes part of the design process. But they have this two, say, uh, scanning device in the arm that allow them to position two arms and then computer will calculate the geometry by itself. So minimum data, two points and the length will create this geometry by itself. So the computer decide where would be the best place to put it. At the very beginning, this is about four meters long, 50 centimeter in width, and they can position anywhere. But we ask computer to distribute 45 those chains in most even a distribution, but to make sure they do not collide, they tangentially touch. At the same time, at the lower part, we would like to connect them so they all become to one piece. So, Computer has to figure out where it would be the good place so they're not putting all in the one location. They want to evenly distribute, but they wanted to connect. They do not want to collide. And because if you make it too many holes in one area, it will collapse because this beam will hold too much of the weight on the one area. So these are the kind of processes the computer will look for. And the first one, like this is the third row, and computer will tell you those are kind of options. And we have developed the kind of hunch, the guess, that where would be the good place, as I said at the very beginning. Computer will tell you 10 different options. And we choose the one that we think is the best possible way. But if you repeat this many times, if you don't choose the right locations, we don't have enough place to put it at the very end, so we get stuck. So we developed the kind of game system that negotiate with computer suggestions our hunch of the best place to put it in order to produce the final output in the most even possible way. So there's a two kinds of participation, the people who use their own ability to interact with the system, but the computer operator is also looking for a way with the best place to distribute in order for the, all the rods to be evenly distributed in the end. So the robots goes and they make in a hole like this, this is at the Shimizu factory. And once the holes are made, a person will come, because I'm a student, and position them into those holes. So in the end, we have this piece that designed by the participants, but also designed by the architect, who are the operator, deciding where it would be the place. So in the end, what we have is the architecture that is designed and fabricated by the people who participated in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will move on to the part two discussions. Uh, while we are setting it up, please enjoy the two videos on collaborative conceptions.
the opening event video on the 1st of August.
let's start the discussion. So, so Kizukiyao collaborative construction comprises several elements. And uh, the topic for discussion one is a circular society and community. Let me introduce the panelists. Mr. Hannes Maya from the uh, ETH Zurich and Professor Yusuke Obuji from the University of Tokyo and Ms. Yukiko Shikata, a critic and curator. Also, Ms. Yuko Takahashi from the Embassy of Switzerland in Japan will join me as a moderator. So we have two questions. The first question is, it's about architecture and circular society and sustainability. So that means how can architectural technologies promote circulation and repositioning? So, um, Yuko, can you, yeah, um, please get, um, please start. So, ETH Zurich, um, and there is a research institute, Groma Geocola uh, Institute. This is a, a research for uh, the a fabrication robotics and and monozukuri requires very high level of ex expertise but introducing digital technology in there by doing that uh, so the technology will be available to many more people and then uh, professor obuchi calls it the democratization of architecture so this uh, collaborative constructions was a kind of a proof of concept of that. And about this uh, kizuki au means. So kizuku in Japanese. Um, this Japanese word has two meanings. One is to build, like architecture, build. And the other meaning of kizuku is to notice or recognize something, find out something. So the word kizuku has these two different meanings. And then we um, use this word as a title of this project. And every week on Wednesday, so 4 PM in Japan and uh, morning in uh, Switzerland, so every week we have communication meeting. Our so Professor Obuchi and then yeah Hannes and myself and also Jonas. So we continue this for several months, and it was originally intended as a communications or PR meeting, but we ended up having lots of philosophical discussions in the meeting. That meeting was very interesting. And that's where we came up with this idea, the title, Kizuki Ao. So uh, mutually find out or mutually build. Yes, the Kizuki Ao, uh, as uh, Yuko-san said, uh, it has two meanings, double meaning. One for the construction of the object, and the other one is being an empathy of uh, the people around you. Because typically architecture is to produce a thing, an object. And the people, how they feel about <coughs> or what they experience <coughs> are not necessarily primary objectives. Those are always some consequence. But why don't we build in that ambition that is by making, we are bringing people together. But at the same time, we try to notice things are not there. But yet by noticing, uh, we empower people's ability to imagine and also to understand people's surroundings. So that's the kind of two. Originally, we just had a collaborative construction because this is Japan and Switzerland. So let's just call it a collaboration. But that wasn't just be enough for us because we have a Tokoname people to also be part of the project. So we want the local people who hosted us to do the project feel that they own the project as much as we own the project uh, for this for this project. Thank you. So through the meetings, I found it very interesting that you know it's a very highly technical. You know, technologies are used, but you turn it into something very. Uh, it's easy for people to understand. So using technology for the betterment of society, betterment of people. So 
yeah, Hannes and Yusuke, you were talking about that. And yeah, I also felt that through um, this project. And I think Yukiko, um, using art as infrastructure, I think uh, um, we have this as a keyword. And, and uh, Yukiko, I think, um, yeah, you are very, um, yeah, I'm conscious about that, right? Uh, hello, I'm Yukiko Shikata. I was very impressed with the presentation. So this um, creative exercises has continued for many years. And I love this title, Kizuki Ao. Yeah, mutual finding and empathy, it's very good. And first, I would like to talk a little bit. I would like to share my impression about what I have just seen today. So I have never um, been able to go there. So I saw some preview and I heard stories, but you know, architecture is something that is built for a very big um, cause. And then my impression of architecture is rigid and very stable, but uh, for this project, it, it's more kind of, it's softer not really rigid. And, you know, what Hannes' um, lab is doing is a very, like, a movable and thing. And I heard that the people can get on to that structure. So I think uh, the free imagination of the users, and I think that structure um, let users find out the new, you know, um, ideas about that. So uh, the term, like, a system of possibility or architecture of possibility, that was the image that I have. It has a sense of fun, not necessarily functional, but uh, yeah, it's, um, in Switzerland, Tingeli, there was a kinetic artist, Tingeli, and then he used junk to make his art. But um, in this project, like uh, uh, wood is used, timber is used, so that it can be eventually um, degraded. Um, and I use this project as well. So people with different physiques and different prop physical properties, I think for some people it's really hard to hold up those uh, heavy, you know, um, pottery objects. And then there is no right or wrong in answer. So I think uh, the body, people's body as an object, I think in early 20s we, we had a look of yeah and so on. So it's not like that. Uh, it accepts more uh, diverse, like, uh, um, physicality. So I think the situation will um, be different if one person keeps holding it for five minutes or so. There is a change. So this is a physicality. I found it very interesting. And may I say a little bit more? You know, Ayusuke says, productivity and well-being, they do not confront each other. And um, Hannes said, you know, yeah, the uh, clay rotunda. I see that object. So the living thing and the artificial thing. So I think we are transcending those two um, confronting ideas. <coughs> so that's my impression. So you do some simulation and you build up different things in a bottom-up manner. So the rules of nature and the rules of computers, they do not necessarily disagree. So, so automaton, um, after tw 1960s, you know, the simulation using computer, we have those uh, things. But uh, yeah, bio model, biological model is very important to turn something into our own organism. So I think that those elements were incorporated in their work. Yeah, yeah clay rotunda, it's like, a, it's like an ant's nest or bird's nest. It's close to those uh, animals' nest, insects' nest. It's wonderful um, that they can produce, create something like that. So it's like a co transcending the conventional concept of art. So it is done in a bottom-up manner. It was great. And art as infrastructure. You know, it has to be something that everyone can participate or join. And there are many artists as individuals, architects as well. But um, in, originally, it was not really like a, a, the art work or architectural work uh, was not necessarily related to per 
individual person. So it was created by multiple people. So it can create a collaboration involving users as well. So I've worked with mass media in curation, and that type of uh, uh, ideas came out in mid-90s, public participation or social interaction, those concepts. So, but I think uh, the architecture can be the last one. You know, uh, the music is the first domain to react to that kind of trend. And lots of creation is possible. And art takes more time, and architecture takes the most, the longest time to make that happen. So that was what um, architecture was like. But now it's changing. The direction is different. It's about the materials and systems and concepts. They are evolving now. So we can think more freely about architecture. That is my impression uh, of these two projects, two installations. Yeah. Uh, that was my impression. Thank you. Okay, let us ask Hannes about their, his view. Okay, so uh, Yukiko just mentioned that the biology and artificiality can be merged at the opening day of the uh, Aichi 2022, he, it was very hot, and uh, he was sweaty, and he, he uh, I want him to uh, cl uh, change clothes into formal clothes, and he was planting uh, some um, plants, and I, I was wondering what that meant. So, Hannes, please tell us what that was. <laughs> Happy to share. Well, I think it's really about creating a place for the community. Um, and it's a brownfield site, it's an abandoned site, um, where I, through the interventions, we try to turn this into a place that becomes important uh, for Tokoname for the people that, that live there, work there, but also visit Tokoname, becomes an, an attraction or a comfortable space. Now, for me, architecture is an open uh, discipline that doesn't end with the uh, structure that we fabricate, but uh, also um, we build for Tokoname uh, the Engawa, um, a Japanese terrace where you can sit. And of course, then you expect a garden or some form of uh, nature surrounding um, your project. So, so my ambition was to start that process and encourage others to, to follow track um, and to turn this into, to, to appropriate uh, the space and, and make it part of their community. Um, because often we, we, we just talk about the technology, uh, but ultimately it's about what do we do with the technology? What impact does it have on our communities and on our society? Well, thank you very much. Uh, what do you think of that, uh, Professor Obuchi? Uh, so you used the uh, technology while attracting local people and uh, well, what uh, have you brought to the community and uh, what kind of qualitative impact on your uh, project display? <laughs> yes, everyone is speaking in Japanese, so I will switch to in Japanese. As I mentioned earlier, what I uh, am most interested in is for uh, people to think of it as their own project, not uh, uh, as users, but uh, uh, but uh, they. I want them to be participants, uh, stakeholders, because people tend to be users uh, nowadays, and. Uh, in the economic calculation, they feel they are one of the users. They don't feel they are participants. They are not actively participating in it. It's sort of a superficial involvement. So I want them to feel that uh, they, want, they are actually participating in a meaningful way. 
so the local res I wanted the local residents to feel that that, that is their project as well. And we, uh, the organizer, uh, try to involve the uh, to try to involve many people. And those people involved um, should feel that they own the project as well uh, by promoting that. The, they may feel they may attach more meaning to sustainability and they can uh, sustain that initiative, not just consuming something after purchasing it, but uh, being part of the creation construction, so shift from users to participants. That was the, the hope that I had. So you are not just creating physical things. Um, so you, you are creating physical things, but uh, you, you are part of it in a way. You, you, you provide a space uh, to enter. Uh, uh, some people may be overactive there in that space, but that space can accommodate such an active people. We don't want to restrict who can participate, right? Uh, so this is a democratic view of the architecture of the creation. Uh, Yukiko, in the field of art, I think participation is one of the key words. In architecture, as we uh, saw, and uh, uh, in the field of art, are there any differences in terms of participation? I think uh, freedom was there in this project. So the, this is not a functional architecture, the uh, structure, right? But um, in the actuality, the functionality is pursued. So art it has more freedom. It's, the functionality is not expected. But um, temporary art uh, uh, is also there. It is, art is project-based. So the process and participation and communication is paramount in art. But in architecture, you need to create something, some structure and uh, some functionality uh, that uh, is expected. But uh, not this project. Um, it's, I felt like it's like a uh, um, festival shrine, a portable shrine, it seems to me. And uh, th th you could use that space in a variety of ways. So in the context of a conventional art and the architecture uh, would not cover that concept of your project. So uh, I think that your project was in between those uh, fields. Do you call it the architectural project or art project? Okay, uh, I will uh, uh, first comment on it, followed by Hannes. So I was thinking of it as a cooling system. So that, that is the overall concept. Otherwise, uh, there will be no sponsors for us, uh, no funding. So I wanted to appeal its functionality. And uh, also, uh, as a research experiment, uh, we wanted to, to display the results of our research project. So that is the positioning of this project. What do you think, Hannes? As an architect, I, I would say it's architecture. And, and what, what is important to know is that it's a heavily regulated uh, building. So we needed to obtain a building permit. We needed to engineer it in such way that it can resist all the forces and uh, comply with all the regulations. So in that way, there has been a very restricted freedom, but of course, then it's architecture and art to push the boundaries and to go beyond the standard. So I think the artistic value of it or the artistic quality of it is that it provokes to think about architecture, think about how we build and to imagine, especially like Shikata-san said in the beginning to be free in imagining um, what architecture can be and, and how we imagine, for example, our domestic environment. I think here it's an example where 
we can speculate on on what it means for for building in in Japan. Also, with the Aichi Triennial's theme still alive, I think if you're still alive, we're still able to innovate, to have ideas, and to investigate uh, the future of of architecture and construction. Ah, and uh, we're uh, creating mist in the system. Uh, we, we wanted to uh, build a roof uh, for a shade, but when we build roof, we have to clear uh, robust regulatory uh, restrictions. So uh, we wanted to sort of, in effect, to create a roof by the mist to uh, block the sun. So this was our way uh, to uh, find a loophole of the regulations. So we wanted to create a thick mist to create a shade. So that is a, a little bit different from a uh, art concept. Nakae Michiko, as you know, uh, has been active for a long time, and she he, she she is uh, she curves, uh, and uh, she she in, is creates in a, a space where the mist can be naturally um, uh, in a different forms. But um, it's a great idea to create a shade by the mist. So that kind of functionality uh, was there. So not just um, actual material, but uh, no material can be part of the architecture. So that is a novelty to me. That's a novel um, idea. So the, in this way, the uh, idea of uh, architecture can expand thanks to the um, tough regulation. Uh, in Japan, but uh, you, you never gave up, right? You uh, try to address that regulation by overcoming the box, and uh, it was cr cr uh, they were you were quite creative, so so you must feel uh, uh, quite uh, uh, well. You we could say that. Um, there's, if there's no mist, there's uh, no shade. So it is a very clever approach. Uh, you could see it, but um, in five minutes, it may disappear. And uh, I, I had to explain that to the regulatory officers. So it was uh, like a game, wasn't it? It was a uh, fun game, and um, you would enjoy how they would react, although it was might have been difficult to clear the regulation. So the the roof of the mist. Uh, what, 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 did you think of um, the cooling system as a base with the mist roof? Yes, I had many ideas running at the same time, um, thinking of uh, sustainability and also uh, utilizing the, uh, the tokoname uh, other where, so we are thinking of um, clearing the regulations uh, with creativity. So based on this experience, I hope the uh, regulation will change for the better. Um, so like on the Hannes side, you know, he talked about uh, traditional wood joining technology and then yeah, he's trying to create the, the decomposable, degradable um, project. And then, uh, yeah, so uh, it is very now important how can this be dismantled and decomposed. So, and then he is trying to achieve that with robotics technology. And so the uh, circulatory uh, circulation in ar uh, in architecture. So. To, um, would you like to talk about some challenges and possibility about using the robotics technology in architecture from the circulation um, viewpoint? Can you please share? Yes, uh, happy to do that. Um, I think, like you saw in the in the first projects of the Rockfront Pavilion, the clay rotunda, you realize that 
it's computational data, it's a computational design that allows us to develop new sustainable methods of building because basically we're integrating knowledge from various disciplines, structural design, material sciences, um, forestry, timber construction, and we can use all this knowledge and through code inform the material process, the material itself. And the robot, or it could also be an augmented reality system, helps us to then produce it accurately. So to bring the digital design into the real world. So it allows us to really rethink bulk material that surrounds us, material that we've hitherto neglected because we could not work with it, we could not control it sufficiently. Hence, in modern times, Le Corbusier and others established a, a, a dichotomy or sort of worked against nature. Nature was the opposite of architecture. And I think now we're, we are entering a time where through necessity and digital technologies, we can, as Shikata-san already said, we can bring nature and technology and nature society closer together. And we have to, because the way we build at the moment is certainly not a sustainable way. Right. About circularity and architecture and decomposability. You know. So uh, this technology has allowed us to look at material, like uh, uh, ch change the way we look at uh, different uh, materials. And so new technology and the new material, what, what do you think about uh, some potential of the things? You know, like Hannah said, you know, by expanding the possibility of robotics and technology, then yeah, it will allow us to expand our thought about how we use different materials. Oh, uh, Yusuke, what do you think? How should I say? Personally, you know, it's easy to say circularity, but do not produce waste in a simple way, you know, waste. S uh, waste is a concept created by humans. So uh, there's no waste in natural environments. So uh, it one uh, waste for one um, uh, animal is a resource for another animal, so to say. So that kind of concept, there's no waste, that kind of concept should be embraced by this uh, modern times, industrial age. I want to think about that because there can be um, new potential materials, but we, when we think about materials, we think only about when we use them, but what after we use them? So uh, I'm interested in what should happen after to the materials after we use that. In case of pottery, it is earth, but once it's baked, it cannot go back to earth. But if you crush it, then maybe it can be used for another purpose. So it will be ideal if, uh, if we can create an environment where resources are always resources, rather than turning them into waste. So, yeah, it's a, yeah. So my view on nature is something like that. So. Maintaining the potential of doing that. So, yeah. right. Like Hannes said earlier, you know, there was a dichotomy, like a two different, two opposing ideas, a nature and an artificial. So, and then now it's a, they are merging. So, and uh, Yukiko, can you offer um, some uh, artistic perspectives on this? Yes, I have some ideas. Whether it's our, our 
architecture or anything. So we have uh, various energy resources around us. By utilizing those um, energy resources, we can promote transformation or we can create new circulation. And architecture can be a part of movable things. Like it's a part of circulation. In terms of sustainability, so um, maybe we need to meet the energy requirement. But this concept has been pursued uh, since like uh, 1990s, but we have robotics or computer and also sensing technology is advancing. There are many things I think we can do with those technologies. Another thing is a degradation, decomposition, the assembly. So there is a um, good book. And this is about decomposition. Biodegradation is one thing, but we also need to look at junk or waste. So metal scraps and so on. And so uh, people working in the recycling um, industry, so they were main um, players in this domain, but the now system is too big and the volume is so big. And then I agree with you, Ske, there is no waste in nature. Everything is resources. So one thing is de decomposed and then it is purified and it is used by another organism. So I would like to achieve that in our world. It's not easy to do that in architecture, but uh, at least some people have started thinking about that. And you know, processing. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the projects that Hannes explained, you know, uh, the gravel and wire, that kind of thing. We don't change the property of the material, so it can they can be reused. And um, one last thing, one thing that I was shocked about, and um, I was impressed by that. Maki Okojima, an artist, Japanese artist, Maki Okojima, and then I was talking with her, and she said recently, his, uh, her experiment, you know, like uh, uh, she put, uh, sorry, uh, there is a person, I, I cannot remember, but uh, there is a person who puts their experiment in the uh, field, and then uh, it's a natural compost, and the worm plays a big role in decompose uh, what is excreted by people. And then um, the worms um, turn uh, the human excrement into uh, the nutrition of soil. And so you put people's feces in the field, and then the worm eats that. And the feces eaten by worm gets through uh, the worm's uh, digestive organ. And uh, sh this person ate the feces of the worm. Yeah, and then as an artist, uh, she tried to eat uh, earth, but uh, uh, it's too mineral and uh, she could not eat that earth itself. But uh, when she ate the uh, feces of worm, she was able to eat it. So it is a kind of a circulation, like a people's feces going into field and the worm eats it and then the uh, worm's feces can be eaten by people. So it can be erotic in a sense, I don't know, like uh, the connection between different organisms and creatures. It's a kind of a circulation, I would say. You know, an architecture to me uh, is something very hard thing, but we talk about the mist and also worms and uh, ecosystem and so on. So very soft things. So maybe architecture can move closer to uh, the some soft thing like a circulation. So Yusuke, uh, can you please uh, summarize our talk? So I have a old like a. Uh, residential houses, and I do some farming, and this kind of a uh, farming work is somehow similar to building a house. And then I modify very old, like uh, um, homes, and yeah, there is there are many common things between these two things. This is about 
building something, making something, and then we use different tools, one in farming, uh, one in uh, building homes. So in the modern times, these two things are clearly separated, but in old days, like uh, those two things are quite um, uh, same things. There are no clear boundaries between the two. So maybe uh, this is a process about regaining that oneness through digital fabrication. Yeah, and because typically in Japan, there is a strong sense of oneness with nature. So I think it's relatively easy uh, for people in Japan to regain that oneness with nature, even with architecture. Yeah, one thing I realized in this discussion, you know, this project might have been a festival, maybe. It's like a community to regain the sense of community. So people naturally create a festival to create a sense of oneness. So this project was, in a sense, a project to involve people, local people. So this, is a, this project was a platform, but we can also call it a, a festival, local festival, to create ties between people. OK, thank you very much. Then I have to close uh, this discussion number one, and we will move to discussion two. But anyway, thank you very much, the panelists, for discussion number one. OK, then uh, let's move on to discussion two. And uh, Yukiko, Yuko, and Hannes, thank you very much. And Yusuke, please stay for the next discussion. And we have a sage side of discussion two. We would like to focus on technology and innovativeness. And then I would like to ask Jonas to act as a moderator. Jonas, um, over to you. Thank you, Hide. Okay, I think we are also waiting for our um, fourth panelist, Fabio. I'm I'm here. It's just the image okay. that is. Yeah. Great. Hello, Fabio. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good morning in in Switzerland. Right. It's um, noon. Thanks. Okay. So this is um, the um, the second uh, part of um, tonight's discussion. We will be focusing a bit more on the human machine interactions side of things and also um, various relations between uh, physical and digital spaces. And um, for that, I have the pleasure to welcome um, Fabio Gramazio, Professor Fabio Gramazio from ETH Zurich Gramazio Kohle, who is joining us um, online from Zurich, I believe. Um, and also, we have the pleasure to welcome Seiichi Saito, principal at uh, um, Panoramatics, which is uh, related to uh, Rhizomatics, which is yeah. the architectural mm -hmm. arm of, um, of Rhizomatics. And um, Obuchi Sensei is staying with us. Thank you, um, Yusuke. Okay, <laughs> maybe I would like to start the discussion by focusing on the relationship between data and the physical world. Um, I'm thinking of a discussion I had in your office, uh, Fabio, just a few weeks ago when you showed me around the lab. And um, you told me about a very interesting concept, uh, digital materiality. And here, um, what really interested me is this idea that we are amassing a huge amount of data about um, the physical world. And how about we flip the question and um, instead of thinking about the physical world through data, we try to think, can we make use of this data to build the physical world? And that, that is a bit where this discussion around uh, digital materiality came um, uh, in. And so Fabio, I would like to ask you if you could just elaborate on that concept maybe in relationship to the uh, project in, uh, in Tokoname, in Aichi Trianao. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, digital materiality 
is uh, has been coined by Matthias, so my partner here at ETH, and myself probably about 15 years ago, more as a as a working tool to express a thing that back then we felt uh, would uh, be and become more and more important. So a word that could describe a synthesis between these two realities uh, we live in, the physical uh, with our body and with our built architecture and uh, the digital that is uh, uh, getting uh, more and more uh, present and dominant. So we could, we could state that in the last 20 to even 30 years, uh, as a society, we have been virtualizing and digitalizing uh, our world. Uh, and we're still doing this. But at a certain point, and this is when we started to think about uh, what the consequences of these things would be to architecture, at a certain point, at, at, a, at the same point, uh, we got the tools. And there is where uh, digital fabrication as a discipline uh, uh, becomes uh, relevant. So we got the tools and the machine to revert this mechanism. So to start to take advantage of uh, the the world that previously was that we digitize and uh, where we produce ad additional parts of it, in order to re reconvert it into uh, physical material. This is what the, the process of digital fabrication actually does to transform data into material. And if, if the material is uh, large enough, then this is or can become architecture. So the, 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 the project behind digital materiality is really to, to bring together two realities that from uh, an architectural point of view really belong together and also, also to reconcile, you know, these uh, supposedly opposite realities. Thank you. Um, and so that means that uh, through, through software, through, through computation, we are basically able to <laughs> update the human capacity for design, right? I, this is what's happening in Tokoname, very uh, concretely. This structure yeah. has a lot of crazy diagonals, crazy angles <laughs> that were calculated with the computer and then assembled by the robots. Yeah, maybe maybe if I if I if I may add, you know, along this uh, extension to the question, I can we can go to the to the core of the of the issue of the problem, which is the relationship between human and machines, or human and robots. And uh, in our thinking, you know, this relationship has more dimension than just the functional one. You know, often if we talk about human machine collaboration, at least in industry then uh, 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 it's very much about how to integrate two systems that are systems that are very different, that uh, you know, perceive the, the, the environment differently and so on. But often it's uh, you know, a challenge uh, uh, here to in, 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 in you know, the perspective of uh, making process uh, uh, possible, then more efficient. So it's, it's a project, project of rationalization. And we think at the same time, even machine collaboration is a deeply humanistic project, you know, because it it goes beyond, you know, this first layer. It uh, it asks, and uh, you know, Yusuke what was what addressing it at the very beginning of the last panel. So, what is the relationship between tradition and innovation? You know, these are categories that often, at least in our Western uh, uh, culture, very very much. I think in uh, uh, far as I know, in, in Japanese culture, this is less of a point. But at least with us, uh, these two categories are opposed. So there is a deep uh, 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 difference and gap between the traditional, the vernacular uh, on one side, and uh, in innovative, the technology, the digitalization on the other side. Uh, and this has a clear uh, reason why it came like this. So it's uh, it's the history of 19th century of industrialization, where humans got, you know, detached from the the process of producing thing, uh, were alienated uh, from 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 this uh, you know uh, more craft uh, like. 
process reduced to you know a certain uh, uh, position into intermediate position in a larger process they would not understand uh, anymore and this has created a deep distrust you know <laughs> towards uh, machines towards technology and at the other time foster at the other side fostered you know uh, romanticism you know so, and, and a vision of an idealized pre-industrial uh, world and uh, we still suffer very much under this simplistic you know dichotomy and uh, and it, it is there, there where we think that through a, 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 a real you know uh, a human machine collaboration uh, uh, attitude or, or you know project where these two realm you know do not exclude each other do not compete with each other but start to make things possible that were not possible before we could really go beyond the the industrial or the paradigm of the industrial era and i think the structure here that we build is is very very strong in these terms you know because it's at the same time and hannes showed it nicely uh, in his uh, keynote uh, at the same time, it's uh, you know extremely reminiscent of uh, of certain material and, and you know, for technological traditions, uh, but it would not be possible in this uh, way uh, without digital technologies, both in production and in design. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's uh, it's uh, uh, not mimicking an idealized past, but it's projecting potential into a future to come mm. and um, just to follow up on, on what you said there is also you 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 discussed um, industrialization and in the last panel so we saw some images of uh, i think you, you showed cars uh, which is really the the symbol of uh, making things in very very large numbers and i feel that uh, robotics and digital technologies also allow us maybe maybe to move away from mass production and at the same time maybe also um, digital technology and, and digital fabrication will allow us to mass produce architecture so, so there is a tension here right are we moving into more individualization or more mass production do you have any thoughts on that maybe yusuke from your point of view um, mine is uh I guess similar to what Fabi was saying, rather than try to take these as an opposing condition and try to reconcile in a kind of dialectic way, maybe they are in fact just treated in the same way. That yes, we I think the society we do have, we have to have mass quantity. I don't think we can go back in the pre-industrial level, but at the same time, we might be able to embrace dealing with the individual subjectivity of their need and desire. So I think this is where perhaps the digital fabrication could really take advantage of mass produced in the same differences, but also dealing with a certain level of quantity in the same. So uh, um, are, we, are we moving into a new phase of uh, extreme modularity, for instance? Uh, I asked the question maybe to you, Yusuke, and also after that to, to Fabio. This is, of course, for me, who is not an expert, a kind of a fantasy. Um, I'm <coughs> thinking of also uh, um, you know, metabolism in Japan and this idea that we would have small modules that we could then assemble and disassemble and then reassemble at another uh, site. But what do you think about this idea? Is, is it relevant or... Is it not the direction that uh, digital fabrication is, is showing to us? Personally, I hope that's the direction uh, that this convention of we all have to have a house, apartments, or you know, condominium. Uh, we could try to imagine without those constraints. Uh, so yes, in very naive sense, that in this is just my personal, but kind of embodying, embracing, as you said, embracing a, a kind of nomadic life. Mm. Very romanticizing, but that's, that's <laughs> just at least how I frame it. <laughs> Let, let's hear Fabio and then also uh, Saito-san. Fabio, any, no. any thought on, on modularity? Uh, I mean, 
I, it, it, I agree. I personally, I think that uh, probably there has been a first first phase in digital fabrication where it was all about you know the 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 the, 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 the specific because this technology allows indeed to do uh, you know. Uh, an, an, an object or for material without uh, having to care about the econo economies of scale that normally at all scales uh, uh, you know matter a lot. Uh, at the same time, I think now with uh, other discussion that have come and that have been addressed in the in the last panel, so circularity and all this thing, I think that, uh, uh, powerful ideas like modularization, so things that can have different meaning and use in different uh, contexts, uh, could could uh, you know have a revival, strong revival. But uh, it's not you know uh, going back to the concept that were developed uh, uh, in 20th century about these things, because these have proven to be uh, you know not strong enough. To, to, to satisfy the needs of architecture that is, you know, uh, pr pr tremendously different from cars. You know, it's not a serial architecture, it's not a serial product. Architecture is deeply uh, 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 dependent on context, on culture, on climate, on, uh, you know, on micro situation and uh, use and, and so on and so forth. So trying to standardize it is uh, 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 not, uh, you know, the right way. But trying to find a new uh, sort of uh, uh, description or concept for what a module could be, uh, a module then allowing flexibility and also allowing it for its partial or complete reuse. Because we have to acknowledge also that programs have always been uh, very unstable and are becoming more and more unstable, meaning that a certain function, it's very unlikely, if I think of Tokyo or other big cities, you know, that will be there in place functioning for, let's say, uh, 100 years, what is a reasonable you know, time span for, for material to, 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 to do its job. Uh, mm. I don't know if I was able to answer the question, but... No, I, I think you, we, are, we are really opening the field here. And you, you mentioned climate, Fabio, as one of the conditions upon which architecture is being thought. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a huge question. Uh, and the, the, the digital side of digital fabrication maybe could allow us to uh, think more efficient way to distribute the, the material, right? Um, Maybe we could ask uh, an algorithm, okay, here is a database of uh, material and how can we organize that, distribute that in a, in a more efficient way. Of course, that's, I think, another kind of um, horizon that um, we can dream or think of. But I want to turn myself to you, Saito-san. Um, from your perspective, how can we um, think space, and, and architecture in, in relation to maybe, in your case, more the perspective of the metaverse. I think this is a bit more mm. where you uh, ground your reflections okay. in. Mm. Yeah, well, interesting question. Like, I studied architecture uh, 20 years ago at the Columbia um, for, as maybe Obisan uh, might know, about back in like uh, 20 years, uh, there are so many like unbuilt projects, which is like well reshaped or, you know, or based on the algorithm uh, using the data, which is compared to now, it's like less data, but then we try to utilize all those. And then we try to find optimized shape. And then at the end, it becomes like a kind of um, unique, a um, expedition of a shape, right? So uh, what I try to say, like uh, back in the day, um, what we didn't need to deeper think about, that becomes deal, which means like, well, so that time, like uh, 20 years ago, there was actually uh, what now we uh, call like a virtual or a XR or, you know, the metaverse uh, discussion, like uh, this is a third time in our uh, century. So the second time was actually uh, 20 years ago, which is like around the 2000. And then, so that time, there was a, 
a lot of discussion about the architecture going to go to like a game universe or the architecture can go to the real universe. But the, what we watching uh, well, through you know the uh, today's presentation is like we definitely um, step into the new era of the, the potential of the architecture, which means the metaverse is not uh, just a virtual. And uh, my definition of the metaverse is more about the community. Or like, you know, uh, um, Obusan mentioned that it's a participation-able, uh, you know, process, which is like the new kind of technique of architecture. But um, in the metaverse uh, industry, including me, uh, we call uh, well, we use a term called um, a uh, competency a lot, mm -hmm. which means like if you have a skill, don't just be user, like be try to be in the process, and then also the composability. Composability is a not just using the things, but you have well, you create your own blocks, and then you try to compose in an entire system, right? So um, what I tried to say is that, well, I don't have any answer yet between the physical uh, architecture world and then also like the, the kind of idea of the metaverse. But um, well, we now we have the, for example, NFT, which is a part of a metaverse uh, from my point of view. Um, it actually has a potential to <coughs> a, as like all the panels mentioned that, um, well, we don't need to go back to the mass production. Uh, well, because, for example, like uh, after the COVID happened, uh, what we call the wood shock, which means like all the price of the wood goes up. Um, and then I was all questioning a to the architects, um, like all over the world, in, well, especially in the Japanese, is that well, we have a forest, but why we have to actually take all the woods from like the Philippines or Brazil? <coughs> still, right? But of course, like there are so many kind of problem of the process in the industry, like uh, forestry industry, or you know the process of how lumber actually take the woods from the, the mountain and then try to make the material dedicated for the architecture, etc. But the um, you know that entire. Uh, thing is like so for, from my point of view like I can't understand like why that thing is happening because of like you know what the the topic of the, this discussion is like um, we have a data right which means like we have an overload view and what we know where <laughs> the things um, actually a luck or we have the uh, the place where we have like more than we need, so why we can cannot match all the things? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like so. Um, so you using you using blockchain and the metaverse blockchain, to, to organize NFT, the the uh, resources or the idea of the metaverse and installing mm. to the architecture industries might actually uh, step into the next era. That's my perspective, mm. right? Yeah. Do, you, do, you see, do you think this is realistic? What, what do, you, what, do you have any thoughts on this idea of mapping the world, turning it into data in a kind of neural world where we can basically understand how to allocate uh, a certain kind of tail and, and then reorganize our surroundings, maybe using uh, digital fabrication, material like uh, uh, timber, uh, knowing where to uh, source the, the, the right timber and bring it to the right place. Mm. So sounds it sounds really amazing when I, when I think about it like that. What do you think? Uh, I think there are, in that question, <coughs> a lot of things Sorry. that need to be broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just a my way of understanding this is what I have said before differences between participants and users um, and um, for me, while the metaverse and, uh, metaverse and 
for me, it's a great that it has an ability for people to participate. So mm. they go beyond the user. I think user is just operating mm. and giving the condition, and they just use that. Whereas you can begin to manipulate, you can begin to use it and customize how you want. And this is what I found it interesting. Now, the question of this uh, efficiencies and understanding the all the interactions, transactions, all these uh, kind of optimized uh, way of understanding uh, activities, to me it's a slightly different uh, level that Yes, it's a level of engagement, participations, and uh, kind of transparency of all that. But uh, again, just kind of bring it back to I am more for participation rather than user uh, approach. Uh, but when it comes to efficiency, <coughs> I like to have things are not totally optimized. I think they are inefficient has the potential uh, and often like like my, uh, this is not my office but you know when uh, when I uh, I think I read somewhere that people begin to just get rid of the people who are not necessarily useful for the work but in fact those are the people that are doing all kinds of uh, kind of creating a community creating an atmosphere creating an environment so getting rid of all that to the streamline isn't always the the best solution. So I don't know if I answer your question, but making everything completely transparent, I'm not quite sure that is the best solution. I like it, things are a bit nitty gritty, things are doing behind the scene. This is just a part of the uh, kind of irrationality of the human being. Hmm. Uh, the, that aspect I like to be maintained in the future. Yeah, a a tension between rationalization and also still the, how should we say, is it the human dimension uh, in the, and 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 because the humans are deeply irrational, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm. <laughs> mm. Fa Fabio, that brings back to what what you said that basically, uh, it's not a kind of opposition between the machine and the human, but it it, <coughs> it should be. Um, more now a kind of a complementary uh, type of relationship, a kind of symbiosis. Uh, can you here somehow align yourself with what Yusuke said? What do you have any any thought to share? Yeah, I uh, I'm not sure. I'm 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 not a, a, a very very much involved or let's say a, a deep a deep. Uh, a, 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 I don't have a deep understanding of uh, blockchain yet. The only thing that I'm sure is that it will uh, play an important role, as many other things we, we went through. Uh, it's not very clear to me if it will be a positive uh, or a negative, or uh, often it's both. You know, if we look back at, uh, at, uh, at the World Wide Web or, uh, you know, social media, all things that have uh, happened. Uh, but all I think is more, more important than, uh, you know, being able to uh, forecast uh, its effect is to recognize that these things are, uh, you know, just there. They have an, a, a dynamic on their own. We cannot ignore or suppress them, or we should not. And uh, they they deeply change the way we, uh, you know, uh, live. Uh, and understand and organize and build space. So these are not these two domains, the metaverse uh, and the physical reality are not disconnected. Sometimes in certain uh, specific uh, uh, moments or discourses, they have been portrayed as being, you know, uh, different, uh, as being opposite, so that you would either you know, belong into or like the physical world or be a fan of, uh, you know, digital communication technology and those things. But uh, the last 20, 30 years basically have uh, have brought to evidence, you know, that these things are uh, uh, just changing, changing our physical reality too. May even if maybe at first sight the physical reality looks from a certain distance, you know, as a picture, 
uh, looks looks unchanged. Uh, 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 in fact, space and the urban space uh, and even the global space. So the fact that we are having this uh, very interesting discussion here today, you know, uh, is unrecognizable. So these were things that uh, 20 years ago nobody would would have uh, 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 you know imagined to come that fast and that radical and uh, and uh, with all the problems uh, connected to it. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to saying is that also these new uh, uh, technologies uh, will, for me, for sure, uh, change or or push forward this change and probably the only important thing as I mean from now from my point of view as architect but I think this is more a point of view of society of civil society it's to uh, build up or put in place an attitude that is open and embracing uh, but at the same time critical because these things do not just happen to us they happen through us so it's the way we interact with uh, technology is the way we think technology is the way we at the end develop technology further at all levels as uh, you know policy makers or communities and so on that then shapes what what will be there uh, in 20 years and is then also responsible on you know the quality of it yeah mm. yeah what would what will be the principle of the principles of the relationship between the virtual metaverse and the physical world uh, and vice versa. And here we, we discuss how it could be highly rational mm -hmm. or it could be <coughs> irrational. Saito, I'm going to I'm going to turn to you. You also, I think, uh, are leading uh, several <coughs> uh, thought processes on, on, on this on these mm -hmm. principles of relation. How how what can they be? How can we what what can be the guiding principles for uh, the city of mm. the future, for instance? Or I, I think the uh, well, for me, um, I totally respect the irrational part of it, the human being or society. But uh, what the technology, including the data for the idea of the metaverse or NFT or blockchain, um, try to a uh, change is that like entire process should be transparent. So what uh, there was an actually uh, um, the discussion with uh, Timmy Gold, uh, the, he's an anthropologist. Uh, I had an interview, and then he say we create too many black box. I think they including the architecture or process of the architecture, which means, okay, I built the house, but the I don't know what inside of what I mean uh, inside of my wall, and then I didn't really peer it, but I don't do it. Which means like I don't know, so there are so many things I don't know, but the what the um, the data or what the the um, technology like metaverse or blockchain or Web three um, like kind of decentralized uh, system try to do is a um, try to make an entire process uh, transparent. So I think we have a light to know like what's inside and then. If you are kind of, you have a skill uh, to be kind of the idea of a composability or competency, like you can actually hands on to the process of architecture. But um, yeah, we definitely <coughs> have to like get rid of, like we, uh, well personally I don't need to like 100% to be transparent, but the most of the thing have to be in the process of a transparent toward, um, I'd say like a 20, 20 years or something. But I think there are so many uh, good things bringing, which means like um, something have to be uh, optimized. For, for example, like I, as I mentioned, like the wood shock or like the circular economy, which means like, well, we have to know the, not the certain amount that we have to know exact amount of wood, like be consumed or we have to know exact amount of, for example, uh, trash uh, we have to actually um, kind of process, right? So it doesn't need to be laughly, uh, but the we actually begin the era of we have to know exact numbers. 
carbon especially, I think will become very, very exactly. precise. Right. And then also the real time. Mm. have to be real time. Mm. Yeah. I, I very much agree on this, uh, uh, you know, statement. And I would even extend it because this, uh, the idea of the black box or that was brought, brought in, I think it's, uh, it's an important one because it's not only about knowing the numbers, uh, uh, being sure about them and knowing the, 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 you know, the transaction and things, but it's very much about understanding how things work because it's only if we understand uh, the mechanisms behind uh, our you know, everyday life uh, or uh, behind architecture, or you could take it whatever example you want. It's only then that we become responsible as a society, as a community, and also engaging, mm. you know? So if we don't wait for a solution to come to us, uh, but if we, uh, you know, participate uh, uh, with a critical, you know, attitude, of course, in develop, developing them by ourselves, then uh, this is maybe, probably, from my point of view, one of the biggest and strongest teaching, you know, of the, 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 the digital revolution until now. You know? With all the, you know, uh, backlashes and so on, we register now, but the fact that uh, we could understand so that the mechanism behind we're not so crazy complex and we could understand and participate in shaping this new world you know uh, uh, was possible to a large extent and this is a matter of education uh, of, uh, of, of 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 culture and i think that this new now frontier of uh, blockchain and so on could probably help you know in bringing back this uh, this uh, feeling of, uh, of empowerment mm. by people. So Very not being users of a bigger system, but being part of something. Mm. You know? Very interesting because we are, uh, so we have extreme rationality, but also mm. the need to be effectively involved in mm. our built environment, <coughs> right? if, if I understand mm -hmm. it correctly. Mm. And I, I find this idea very, very striking. Mm. Uh, Maybe it relates also to what you said a bit before, uh, Yusuke, uh, about... No, about I, I, I totally agree with it, but at the same time, um, we cannot rely on the perfect answer in order to make any decision. And I think, for me, using visual technology, which allow us to have a hunch or certain, say, a guess, um, so it's not about creating more black box through which we can manipulate things that perhaps we don't know, but we cannot, this is just my personal, uh, we cannot just completely depending on the technology to make all the decisions so we just follow mm. or that mm. I'll give us the ability for us to make any decision when there are multiple possibilities are present at the same time. Mm. So I think for me, there's still mm. a b mm. bit for both that I, I fully agree with both Tiger Sun and Fabi was saying, but, but, but at the same I, time, I, I, there are yes, a level of uh, a kind of unknown. Mm. I, I agree with you, Yusko. I think it's, it's just two different things. You are talking about the creative process they are very much subscribed that uh, that uh, it's not wishable and probably also not uh, thinkable that this can be rationalized uh, because at the end of the day you know there is never an optimum to 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 any problem and uh, you know you can do your your design is then by trying to 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 do the best thing you can under the, the specific condition you're operating in. But on the other side, if I you know, think of uh, reuse and circle economy, economy, there it's not so much about optimizing a design, it's just a deep precondition to be able to seriously talk about this mm -hmm. possibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, needs a large amount of data that is processed in real time, so basically need to know uh, uh, in pre at present, in space and time, where uh, material is, and also to be able to forecast where it will flow in a in a you know in a short term and mid term future. Otherwise, if you're not you know there is no point in mm. design for circularity. Mm. Mm. Well, what I try, 
I, I, I think this is a really in interesting discussion and also like an important discussion um, that like, well, because uh, I think a lot of people believes, especially like over 40 years old people, including me, uh, use the word technology. Well, because the technology, we feel like technology is a magic, but it's a technology, it's not the magic. As you may hear about the, like for example, AI, we have to feed them. Like we have to tell them, like we have to teach them, which is a <coughs> like a huge educational process to make it work. But uh, your students, uh, my students, like age twenty, they don't use the, the word technology because they're they just use, for example, like the smartphone as a tools. So we have the digital is not the magic, but it's just a tool. Means. Sometimes we use the digital, or we sometimes we use uh, the NFT. But sometimes we just use the physical, um, I don't know, money, or sometimes we use the physical oh. mobility. Um, so we have a lot of choice. Like uh, compared to maybe like 10, 20 years ago, we have mm. uh, so many tools, uh, newly aligned. Um, so we have. I mean, as a designer, like we have a, a more choice to actually pick. So sometimes, like products, um, for example, like have to be cheaper or have to be like you know the f um, sustainable. Like we can uh, find a path for like the deeply optimistic. I mean, and uh, optimize. But the sometimes, like you know, we we respect the class or you know um, the old fashioned kind of process. Like we can go for it, right? So, uh, what I understanding like is through the research of the metaverse or NFT or blockchain, like we just got the new tools. I think that that's really important. So that's like um, as the Fabi say, like the education is so important to actually teach like um, more teaching like the old fashion, new fashion, or new materials, or new process, or new technology at the same time. And then so the designer can have a lot of choice. And yeah. a good I, I, I very, oh, Yes, Fabio, go ahead. You will have the- I just, the, wanna, the, I just wanted to support this, uh, this, this term, uh, this idea of the, of the tool. The tool is a very powerful concept. It's basically, it has uh, always been the Thing that you allows you to build, to change, to inform uh, the world. Being it physical or digital doesn't matter so much. This is one thing that resonates with it, with this term. And the other thing to me, what is a very dear to me, is the tool is something personal. You know, it's inscribed in a in a cultural technological context, but the tool is something that I build for myself or that I you know, inherit from somebody else that educated me and then I extend it to hand it over to, to the next one. Mm. You know, and there this idea of craftsmanship that we extend, like to extend to the idea of the digital craftsmanship, being ambiguous, you know, on the, on the nature of its output uh, uh, is very important because all this categories of empowerment, of responsibility, of, you know, active engagement and so on are inscribed while if you talk about technology at large uh you know it's not so clear what it does what it is what it you know, comp you know what it includes uh, how it relates to the individual uh, how it relates to power structures and so on and so forth thank you fabio i i i feel we would have material to discuss for another two hours but uh we will have to slowly get to the end I, of the of the um, discussion. I I feel that human the the role of human agency is definitely still under debate. It's still going to be very important, but but it's in very so interesting that it's still a very open um, debate. I think we will shift into a question and answer session. We can take questions. Feels like we've gone uh, sorry, I. <laughs> I, I just read the first line. We do not have, I'm sorry. So I apologize. We do not have time for questions and answer. I would then like to thank our panelists once again, uh, Fabio Gramazio, Professor Fabio Gramazio from ETH Zurich, Professor Yusuke Obuchi from um, TADS, Obuchi Lab, um, Tokyo University, uh, 
Saito-san from uh, Panoramatics who joined us tonight. Thank you very much to all of you. Also, thank you Hide for uh, being with us on on the whole uh, evening and, and driving the whole um, event. I also want to uh, thank uh, curator and art critic uh, Shikata-san and of course uh, Hannes Meyer, the project leader of uh, uh, the Eteha uh, Tower in Tokoname. Thank you very much, Hannes. And of course, also my colleague, uh, Yuko Takahashi, who moderated the uh, first panel. All right. Thank you for sticking with us. And uh, I wish you a good evening. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we thank our speakers and participants. constructions uh, on until the 10th of October in Togoname. Please visit it. Thank you very much.